first of all i want to um, thank uh, dr aditi uh, and as you all know already but i thought we'd go over it again she's about more than 40 years of experience and her passion and interest is the dental sleep medicine uh, she's currently the president of the british society of dental sleep medicine and the british academy of dental sleep medicine so uh i mean that we can discuss later as the where are we in this nascent stage in india about uh dental sleep medicine and how to take it forward i mean it's like so i truly believe that sleep uh, medicine is a multidisciplinary speciality and we need people from all aspects fields to work together ultimate aim being to help the patient Uh, so that's the reason that we invited her and i again want to say that she was really kind enough in her busy schedule to give us these lectures for you people um and so i want before we go forward if uh, the ones who are here you can turn your videos on and uh, kind of turn the audio let's hear just a one or two lines about your introduction and uh, something about you know what brought you to this and your interest in this field uh one by one they can skip i can see dr girija so you want to start dr girija yes yes uh, can you hear me ma'am yes i can hear you yeah 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 so this is dr girija here and uh, myself i work with dr ishita dr aruna dr umre as an associate dentist in oh, the okay. aesthetics clinic yeah <laughs> so this topic is really new to me i have done all the four modules but then i hope i will learn more here This is really very new to me. I mean, in our graduation, we were not knowing that we have done such a lot of things. We don't know. <laughs> okay, so something but brought you to learn this, no? So yeah, what is yeah. It that, what is it that made you think that you want to learn this? Yeah, what made us think that, uh, like, in since one or two years, we can see many patients are coming with the complaint, like they have a back pain or a headache or everything. And I have seen Dr. Umre also. Uh, advising them to go for sleep study so i was like hey what is this what, what is, is this something yeah so okay. that's why i want to learn yeah okay uh who else is there i can't see all the videos some of them dr aruna is here and there's somebody called one plus nine pro 5g is <laughs> his phone number <laughs> okay somebody else uh wants to say what about you aishita Yes, hi. I am uh, Dr. Ishita, and uh, I have been in uh, practice for eleven years now. And uh, me, Dr. Girija, Dr. Aruna, we work with uh, Dr. Umre, dental aesthetics, and uh, we uh, will we'll see a lot of cases like how Dr. Girija mentioned uh, of you know where we refer patients for sleep sleep studies, but. uh and we have actually made uh, a few mandibular advancement devices in um, which were available in india but we were not really happy with them and you know we were not we are still not very confident on to how to titrate them so just wanted to know more about it and I, we definitely I, i knew there were more devices in available which we don't have knowledge about so that was the reason when um, uh, dr bhatia had sent me a, a i think uh, some ex uh, detail of the program quickly i just wanted to know that what else is available so that is how um, i i decided to join and then we ran through uh, me dr aruna and dr girija ran through it and uh, that's how deva girija excellent uh i think we've got uh, dr runit now dr runit you and i have connected on linkedin you asked me a few questions i believe uh yes ma'am i did uh, ask you a few questions uh so uh to introduce myself i'm dr runet i practice in kolkata uh since the last 9 years and uh, my interest actually started from orofacial pain and temporomandibular joint disorders so uh while exploring the field uh, a lot of people from pain usually transition to sleep uh so uh, that got me interested in pain, uh, dental sleep medicine and uh, i have attended a few 
conferences so but uh, there are very limited training opportunities in india so as soon as i saw that there was one i grabbed it with both hands <laughs> and i'm just hoping that we can have more yeah well we'll come back to your transition later so once we've um had the, uh, we had six people once gone ah uh, there we are there okay anybody else dr matra snigda anybody else dr batra is actually on mute so is dr dev dr hi ma'am it's dr tarini i am in a low signal area okay so you can keep the video up and talk i guess you can just say a few lines tarini okay. yeah 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 no no i have changed my phone so i think now it's not going to be an issue yeah, hi a... auntie how are you <laughs> i'm okay tarini <laughs> so tell us about you Yeah, hi. I'm an orthodontist. I finished my residency in 2018, and my thesis was uh, to do with, you know, part of pharyngeal airway. So it was a CBCT-based study where we gave an appliance which is known as Advanced Sync. That's an Omco appliance. So on, you know, mid-teens, we did the study, and then pre-treatment and post-functional treatment, I did a pharyngeal airway analysis. so through that um i kind of realized that okay there is a significant change that comes about and then we also had something known as a la- progress uh, oh. yeah so with that um my you know sub specialty interest in a way became dental sleep medicine okay good Right, that's interesting. So we will speak about that, and I think we've got someone else. We've got a Zoom user, and we've got a One Plus Nine Pro Five G user who's oh, on mute. I think it's okay then. I think we can probably catch up with them. So, yeah. Doctor Aditi, uh, would you like to add a few tips first, or do you want them to go with their questions first? whatever you would like if uh, whichever one you would want me to do i'm quite happy you you know i'll just tell, like i said dr manveer patel has introduced me as someone who's you know been a dentist for over 45 years my interest in sleep medicine arose quite by chance over 15 17 years ago when a patient came in and shoved something in front of my face and I said can you fix this and i had no idea what it was absolutely none and this is when i was the bbc dentist in town and i i thought about it and i said well, what is it and he said it's to help me sleep that's all he said and then i after that i sort of did a little bit of research and that's how i got into sleep medicine. and now i run the entire dental sleep medicine uh, programs in the country so, so that's my i would like to know what that is but i can first let's ask because uh, we have limitation of time so people if they have any uh, questions you have Uh, an excellent uh, teacher educator experienced person dr aditi will answer so i think this one to one is a rare opportunity so please go ahead and ask and then we can if you have time then we will have some other interactions i think one the last edition is on mute by the way so she probably can't hear anything we're saying she left yeah. okay. so uh, who wants to go first questions <laughs> Okay, I'll go. Okay, go on. Should should I? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, ma'am, uh there was something in um uh, in your lectures which I did not understand when you were talking about uh, of course when the pharyngeal airway uh, there was something about the less collapsibility of the pharyngeal airway and less sensitive ventilatory control that determines the efficacy of the treatment. so how do we how do we determine whether there is less ventilatory what is the tool is there a test or it comes in the sleep study so the answer to that is we don't we can't. and okay. the reason we can't is because this one thing you must always keep at the forefront of your mind it is a medical condition it's right. not a physical condition it's not like toothache it's a medical condition and we are providing treatment from a dental perspective So these patients who are referred to you in the first instance are those that have been assessed, screened, 
you know, they've had their sleep test carried out, you know, Dr. Bhatia will tell you. And from that sleep test, you can determine what the underlying pathophysiology is. So right. the, the two types of, uh, or the two elements of this, you know, four phenotypes are that if they've got a slight lower loop gain, so their ventilatory system is not as sensitive and unstable, not sensitive, unstable, then they do well with dental devices. And then people with a very anatomical based problem, such as, you know, micrognathia, um, tongue size, you know, whether they are, um, they're, they're born with, you know, they've got tonsils, you know, all of that is another aspect of it that we can help these patients by improving that airway by pr protruding the jaw. If on the other hand, somebody's got a very narrow jaw, very, you know, a collapsible tongue, for example, but they have very low muscle responsiveness, for example, their muscles just don't respond to stimuli as well as a normal muscle would, then they won't do quite so well. So for us, it's, it's a very difficult, we don't have a predictive model. Right. So we just I, have to try it on a patient and see how the patient responds. So to keep it simple, let's put it this way. So what are the treatment options for uh, snoring in OSA? There's a CPAP and it's various formats, you know, APAP, BiPAP, whatever. Then there's the mandibular advancement devices. And then there's the surgical options. Yeah. Everything else are adjuvants. You know, you add on little bits and pieces. Yeah. So really when they've tried CPAP, for example, or they don't want CPAP, what are the options available to them? A device. Yeah. So you yeah. try the device and you have to, you have to sort of almost manage the patient's expectation. The patient comes in, he's huge, but he's got a very small jaw. So what were you going to say to him? Oh, yes, you've got a small jaw, so I'm going to fix you. No, you can't do no. that. Yeah. They're so big, yeah. they might be so fat. Maybe yeah. their muscle responsiveness is low. So all you have to do is temper their expectations and say, look, you know, we're going yeah. to do the best we can and, and see how you respond. And the titration protocol that Dr. Gir just said, well, I will talk to you about that in a minute, is, is all you can do. You have to tell them it's a medical condition, dental intervention. Science is not exact. Yeah. Never guarantee 100%. You have a toenail removed. You cannot yeah. in writing that you will never have another ingrowing toenail. There's always a small risk. Absolutely. All we yeah. can do is try and do everything we can with education, experience, careful assessment, minimize the risks and improve the outcomes. That's all we can do. Yes. If I were to put it the other way around, uh, that we know we don't have any strong predictors of who will do well. Yeah, there are no predictors. I mean, there, there are sort of, you know, yeah, some a few, suppose, but they're just predictors. That's all. Suppose the other way around, who are the ones who will not do well? There's no such thing either. Okay. There's no such thing either. So, you know, you, I mean, I have treated some severely obese okay. and severely apneic patients. And I've looked at them thinking, hey, Ron, what am I going to do? <laughs> but do you know yeah. what? I've actually got their AHIs down from 56 down to 0 0.1 with wow. one titration, with one titration. It's all to do with the individual. The individual's response to treatment. And yet there it's are others who are just mild snorers. They yeah. come in and they keep on whinging. Oh, I'm still snoring. Oh, I'm still snoring. My wife tells me I'm still snoring. And you know, what can you do? You just say to them, please just go away. We'll get your wife some earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to ask one more thing. In your experience, how, I mean, it's, it's very hard. I'm just putting a general question. Yes. How long does it take for an individual to get used to the device? How long is a piece of string? So basically it depends on the appliance selection. The bespoke high-end devices are phenomenal. And depending on how good the patient is, you know, you always get the whingy patient and you've got the very good patients who are tolerant and they'll, you know, I remember when I first started practice, I digress a little bit here, but I used to work in a very sort of deprived area of London. And I used to make something like 10 dentures a day over and above everything else, right? And you had patients who came in and you put the dentures in the mouth and, you know, before they you were in the mouth, they said, sorry, it doesn't fit. I'm sorry, this is terrible. 
And then you've got the other patients, you put them in your in their mouth and you think, oh, you know, this is not quite what I want them to be. And they will say, you know what, this is amazing. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you. And they go and you never see them again. They're very tolerant and they will do well. So that's exactly the same principle with dental devices. You have to look at their comfort levels and how they, you know, when they come across, their personality will tell you a lot about what they're like. And if they're the people who are always complaining about something or the other, then you should have a little red flag up there saying, be careful with this patient. And, you know, you may end up making another device for them if they don't get on with one, then you have, then that is how you actually cost the devices as well. Always plan for failure. In your uh, in your sort of uh, um, fee structure, you should have your hourly rate, your overhead per hour, you know, your own personal overhead, and then you have to have the device fee, consumables, and your staff cost. And then on top of that, you add, you add on what we call the plan for failure fee. So if you were going to charge somebody, I mean, in London, we, you know, uh, we pay a huge sum of money for dental devices. You know, patients will pay anything up to three, 4,000 pounds per device. But average, how much is the cost for a device? What but is- again, if I'm working from a, a range of devices, anything from 500 pounds right up to three, 4,000 pounds. I am probably the most expensive in London, but they get absolutely I call the patient before they come to see me I explain what I do I explain how they work then they by the time they come to see me they already know what's good and this making the devices is another issue yeah well we I only work with those that are made by um, established companies who only make medical devices I do not work with anything that is not a medical device so for India, I, I would like to ask uh, the young dentist that I hear. So, you know, where we are stuck is you are right that there is a, only three options available. Surgery is of course down the la- line. So we are st- left with CPAP and dental device. So, I mean, that's my experience so far. I have not had a lot of success with the inputs from the dental. That's why this course, I was hoping that some more people would join and help us with the dental devices. So, so which dental device do you work with? Sorry? Which dental devices do you work with? I don't have anything. So really? I have worked with Silencer, Herbst, and I've also worked with a modification that I had made personally, which was a Forces, and then I'd made like, um, like connected, use that as a connector for the upper and lower arches, the Forces appliance. So which was a kind of like the same model as a Herbst. Appliance. So I hope that you will probably give that up. I I think it's cumbersome. There are breakages. It's um yeah, and silencer is a very flimsy device. So I'll tell you what silencer is. Silencer are two suck down splints that yeah. have this breakable arm on the side. And yeah. I have my entire career never made one. Mm. I've never made a silencer. I, I I know of them. I've I've you know had a look at them. I know that they're used in certain hospitals here on the, you know, on the NHS, but I don't make them. The reason I don't make them is initially when they first launched, they used to have the device. And if anything broke, like the arms, you know, the blue arms, they yeah. broke. They had to go back to the lab for them to fix, to come back. Now, my patients, I don't have the luxury of charging a patient, whatever it is. I mean, 500 pounds, yeah. for example. And then say to them, I'm really sorry, but this is broken, but you have to be now without a device for two weeks. I don't like my OSA patients to be out of treatment for that long. Now it's a little bit better because they send you a series of arms. Yeah. But it's not the best device because it doesn't fit very well. It's unhygienic and it's not very easy to titrate. So what about the other group here? You know, can we get some insight on how one can get help in making the devices? And um, Ishita, yeah. So we also was we also were working with Silencer SL, and we were also not very happy with it. So I was thinking that if we work with the appliances that you have mentioned, the micro two 
prosomnus and the sono prosomnus so and somnomed yeah so so my go to company remember also that device your device selection will also depend on your psychology the company that gives you a good deal but not not free but you know good deal the company that respects you and the company that sorts your problems out as soon as you know they can and they're not arrogant about it now these are the companies i like to work for and for me the go to company is somnomed Yes, Somnomad actually approached me, uh, and uh, you know we kind of were thinking of having an agreement. But I mean, obviously, I need a dentist, and I I can't do so much of that work myself. Well, but the thing is, you know, we are we are just relaunching the academy on the first of July, and I'm taking the entire masterclass to the APEC countries on the first of September. So it's all going to be online webinar based, and it's going to be funded. by somnomed and i think somnomed are a great company i get on very well with the ceo neil verde and you know i it, i'm happy to ease the wheels okay so i think that will be a good thing because you, I, you, I mean i could train any one of you you don't have to have any any dentist you need a trained dentist so there's no such thing as one device fits all but there's no such thing as only one device is better than the other there is no such thing it depends on the situation so if you have a snorer for example no i say snorer perfect teeth then you might get away with something like a silencer if mm. they don't have the money because you know you just you put a, an anchor in the, in their tongue and pull that tongue and the jaw forward and drop the anchor you know hook and an anchor it'll work of course it'll work what you want to base your selection on is the complications that arise as a result of your choice so if you provide a device that doesn't fit very well then the patient will be uncomfortable they won't be quite so compliant so you won't be able to get the treatment efficacy or the effectiveness has any and, sorry now to you has anybody ever asked that the question that we get asked here often is that uh, suppose how do i try it what we say to patients is if you want to try it there are two ways one is go and buy one from the internet from amazon stick it in the, in hot water you know uh, try it but make sure that you pull your jaw forward however expect that you will be uncomfortable your teeth will ache your jaw might ache but if they stop snoring then you know that the device is going to work that's one thing the second thing is there are trial devices that are available in the world which are very reasonably priced you make them a trial device they go away try it for a week up to a month and then they come back and then at that point they're also titratable some of them so they can titrate it themselves until they stop snoring start feeling better and they cannot titrate any further forward because you know we are working with a three dimensional model here and you know we can only pull that jaw as far forward as the body will allow so that is the position if they say you know i've stopped snoring i feel great my wife loves me again is back in my bedroom now so that is a position that we can make some advice with and these trial devices do you people know anything about them i don't know anything in india no we we learned in the lecture only the matrix device from from canada and the apnea guard from california no yeah. So, so Matrix has just gone under. I'm afraid it's just gone into administration, and it's it's it's, it's a great uh, way of getting that position of the jaw and to know whether this patient is going to actually uh, respond to treatment. And they're not so expensive. They're expensive, yeah. But in this country, they're not uh, licensed to to have you know to be offered anyway. Uh, the apnea guard is probably the best one I've seen. the best one that i've used and i know dan lavadanski extremely well and if any one of you need or want to try any just you know message me directly and i'll see if i can get some across to you can we can we order also if we can get some numbers of or should we just directly contact you for somnomed as well as the apnea guard yeah i mean obviously Somnomed are not going to suddenly start sending the odd device here and there. You need to establish some kind of uh, basis. So after this call, uh, uh, Doctor Manveer, you and I can have a chat, 
and maybe we can establish you know some kind of pathway yeah. and have a local representative initially and see whether we can process it are, are any of you scanning by the way or are you all taking impressions as of our clinic does do scans yeah what scan I mean, uh, from an orthodontic point of view, we're doing iTero and all of that right now. So you can use a scanner and then the scanner connects automatically to the lab. Right. The lab will then send the device. It is phenomenal. My practice has changed so much since I've started scanning. So I Somnomed have... has, has a particular software through or, or any... Uh, scanning device works. No, and device. Yeah, it oh. connects to their digital platform. That, but that is something that we can talk about and we can set up for you. It's not a, it's not a difficult thing to do. Look, if I can learn it, anybody can learn it because I'm not terribly <laughs> clever with digital any, technology. Any other pressing questions from people? Dr. Runit, you have no questions at all? <laughs> no, I have questions, ma'am. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you what are, like you told that you, we should keep around, uh, you know, three, four devices in our armamentarium. So uh, uh, like uh, you probably keep Somnodent, ProSomnus. Apart from that, uh, what are the devices that you, you know, that are your go-to devices? You can have the uh, TAP devices from Avometrics. You can have, have the silent store. I'm never going to say never. There's always going to be an opportunity for you to try something with like Silensor, you know, Somnomad. The Somnomad has a range of devices, by the way, not just the one. Uh, they've got the Fusion, the Flex, they've now got the new one called the Avant. And they've got the, um, um, the Edentulous one, patients who are Edentulous on the top and have a few things at the bottom the device for those patients. So that has also changed because people used to say, well, you know, with the uh, in a dentalist's mouth, you cannot make a dental device. That's not true. We can. We can now make dental devices. And then there's the Narval from Resmed. There's a Respire from, um, uh, I think they're now called Whole U. So there are so many devices that are available. Now, I believe that there's a device from Pune. You know that, don't you, Dr. Matya? Yeah, it reminds me of the silent so, but I, I have no comment. I have, yeah, I've kind of seen him around on the LinkedIn and then talked to him, but I, I don't know much about the device. No, I don't particularly care for the device because what I've seen reminds me of the silent so. But then, you know, look, I, I'm lucky enough that I work in a, in, in a clinic where my patients are high network and they, and it, you know, they just say to me, you, you're the boss, you, you, you do whatever. But you know, everybody's not like that. We have, to, we have to actually gear our practice to provide treatment for as many as possible from all walks of life. So if you end up you know, having to make two suck down splints and attaching the herbs down, there's, I would never say don't ever do it because quite frankly, you know, people deserve treatment. People deserve to feel better. And if that's all they can afford and that's all they can have, so be it. I mean, it just means they might have to replace it a little bit more uh, frequently. For example, the prosomus devices, they're guaranteed three years and they don't have very much biogunk on it. That means it doesn't attract any much, too much plaque and debris on it. So it doesn't become colored, it doesn't smell, and they've just brought out a new, new material called Evo. And it's got a little bit more flexibility, so it's very comfortable. Um, it's hugely expensive, but you yeah. know, it's, it's good. It's good. For somnus, uh, sorry, the Somnomed devices have a silicone lining on the inside, and that's the only lining in the world that I know of that can be replaced. Any other lining in any other device, in a tap or from a metric anywhere, it delaminates, and then you cannot replace it. So this is the beauty of the Somnomed devices. Sometimes, you know, the patient comes in after a year and say, oh, Dr. Sai, my tooth broke, so I had to have a crown, and the dentist didn't know what to do. Now my device is fit. That doesn't mean they have to have a new device. I just send the old device up to the lab in Sheffield. They, you know, strip it, and they reline it for me, as long as it's a minor change. So, you know, that's how you actually, if somebody has a patient who's got, you know, patient comes in and they've got a lot of dental teeth in their mouth, for example, crowns, um, bridges, work, 
you know, these are the patients you need to be planning for failure. Do they need a lot of, uh, do they need a lot of uh, dental work done again and again? Then you actually manage these patients accordingly. You choose your device depending on the patient's mouth. You don't want to make them a prosthomous device if they're going to keep needing dental work done because the prosthomous device is not forgiving of changes in the mouth. Now um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, like, do we need to treat all snorers, or do we need to treat only patients who have uh, OSA or uh, like? Does benign snoring needs to be treated? So, benign snoring is when a patient snores occasionally. Okay, and they don't have any complications, any side effects. In my opinion, and the opinion of one of my mentors, Professor Williams, there is no such thing as benign snoring. If you are snoring every day, and you don't have any symptoms, that doesn't mean that it's not doing the damage in your body, because you're still getting micro arousals in your brain. So according to him, and I don't know about what Dr. Bhatia would say, but you know, if you're getting micro arousals every day, snoring through the night and loudly, then it's bound to have some kind of neural effect. So, yeah, so I, I think the question, was it the question that you need to treat all snorers or was it the question was that do you need snoring to be treated with dental devices? No, no, he said do uh, snores need treatment. Yes. So in the UK here, our, you know, our NHS, we follow guidelines and the NHS guidelines are that if you have a snorer, who has no symptoms whatsoever, you do not treat them. I don't agree with that because I believe, number one, it's a continuum. The snorers will become OSA, mild will become moderate, mild will become severe. It's a continuum. Uh, catching them as soon as they start. Ma'am, what is uh, a good appliance for bruxis, for sleep bruxis? Because somewhere, uh, I think in your third webinar you'd mentioned regarding you know so you have to first diagnose whether the patient is is suffering with sleep bruxism if so then an oral appliance can in fact increase the ahi so that needs to be uh, first diagnosed and then we go for an appliance but either ways we'll be giving an oral appliance so then for a sleep bruxer is there a more sleeker i don't know like I just slightly misunderstood the message i right? if i've got it wrong i'm on the uh, webinar, I'm sorry. So what I was saying is the research shows, I mean, nobody really knows exactly, but they believe that 25 to 40% of sleep bruxes yeah. have a OSA. Yeah. 25 to 40% of OSA patients might have sleep bruxism. Okay? Yeah. It could be tonic, it could be phasic. And they believe that some of yeah. these patients might be bruxing in order to try to open the airway just before they're about to collapse. Yeah, the sympathetic stimulation due to, yeah. First rule, is that my phone that's making a mistake, uh, noise in the background? So, um, you hear me okay? You know, so, I think we, if we log off, I mean, this kind of takes us off. I will send another link and I think this connect back again. It's gone now, so let's leave it. If it starts again, then we'll, we'll start again. No, I'm saying, you know, with ah. the Zoom might end in about a minute. Ah, okay, okay. We'll have some more questions. So okay. I will then just send another link and we can just log back again. Okay, that's fine. So that's basically what I'm saying is when somebody's a sleep bruxer and make a complaint without assessing them for underlying sleep apnea, and you are crystallizing that jaw, you're putting a bulk in the mouth, which is going to crystallize the tongue, and they might become worse. Now, that is a definite possibility. And there's no The way to treat these patients is by protrusive. Them a device that protrudes them, not crystallizes them. Yeah. That's the message. Any device that protrudes... I was saying she had some... Yes. I wanted to um, ask, is, are there any questionnaires that can be shared uh, which we can use for uh, diagnosing patients for sleep apnea? 
you cannot diagnose patients. I'm sorry, just uh, screening, just for screening. Yes. yes, there are questionnaires that you can get. Lots and lots of them are available on the um, on the internet, but I can probably share something that I that I use. Yes, that would be very yes. helpful. Just an assessment, you know, is the ESS questionnaire, you know, it's um, ask them how they snore, whether they snore, how they sleep, how often they go to the bathroom, you know, what's their BMI, that kind of questionnaire. But we can probably share something with you. Yes, okay. and uh, I also wanted to know that, um, can we get a video uh, demonstration in terms of a recording of how to record on the gauge? If you, I, all right, so if you go onto YouTube and you look at George Gage, there's a fantastic video that shows you how to do it. Okay. All right? Okay. Even the titration? So titration, you don't do the titration with the George Gage. Yes. For the device. Yeah, you don't do it for the device itself. So the device is fitted, and depending on which device you've chosen, you use that to titrate the device forward. So say for the silent saw, they've given you different blue um, side links, right? You just change them. With the somnomat, there's a screw, or there's a little herbs uh, element, or they've got these little wings that you change. So each one has its own unique titration protocol. Okay. But, so the, the, sorry. but the patient itself, you use you what you do is you get the ICP the position maximum. So if you say you go from ICP to maximum, say 10 millimeters, you usually start off by making the device at about 50 to 60 percent, depending on which device you're using, right? So you go and push the jaw forward by say six millimeters, you record that bite, the device is made to that position, but there's no guarantee that that position is gonna work for that patient. So then you get them to go home and say, you will still probably continue snoring. You'll probably still feel tired, but this, I want you to get used to wearing the device for a week or 10 days, then come back to me and I'll show you how to titrate it yourself or I can titrate it for you. So if you feel that the patient is responsible enough, you can show them how to do it themselves or you do it for them, one millimeter at a time. Okay. So right. for the silencer SL, because that's the only thing that I have used, it, they didn't send, give any instructions and I kept trying to take out the blue bands and trying to place them and there was no information that was given from any company or anything. So uh, I, how do you learn to do that? How do I, because it's... It's cheaper than the ones which are spoken about, but still it costs something to the patient. And if by pulling and pushing, if we break it, then we, when the lab says that you have to, they charge again. Have you tried to um, contact the, the company? Uh, the lab people or the assistants only come, but I can try no, to- I'm sorry, that's not a good enough, uh... Uh, situation because if if a lab is going to give you something they need to be responsible for it it's a medical device and I'm, I'm very strict about this if anyone sends me anything i mean prosomas the other day sent a device to me no instructions nothing and i went and i went straight to the ceo and i said you know what you continue doing this i'm not going to make your devices because i don't want the, to have the hassle of going on the internet pulling out the instructions these are high-end devices these are expensive Silencer is not that cheap either, you know. For what it is, silencer in India. I'm not sure. How much do you pay for silencer? Five, uh, five thousand or something. Is a device. Yeah, for the device. Uh, is that right? Five thousand, right? Here we pay like two hundred on something pounds just for the lab, which is nonsense. Tarini, you're on mute. Sigda, just write to Tarini. She's on mute. I've seen the prosomnus device and uh, when I was calculating the conversion, so it was around 25 grand or so, if okay. I'm, I could be wrong. Then I was thinking of the overhead charges like you talked about, the hourly rate, etc. 
the problem what happens is with these amazing devices that you talk about in the indian market we we have we are kind of inadvertently forced to work with an appliance like silencer i know that it's a flimsy appliance i know you need a stable appliance to hold bony and hard structures so that it would be effective you know so but i i don't agree with that fully uh, there is a definitely a market for higher end individuals who are willing to pay we yeah have the largest number of billionaires in the world from india <laughs> but, but i'll tell yeah. you but we have to be very confident yeah. that it will work so very yeah. often people come and tell me you tell me where to go i will go and i when i'm just talking about from myself that i really don't know where to send them so i say i don't know well what when the world opens up i'll come and train you all I'm telling you, it's all about so doing it again and again. Twenty five thirty. But I think what I really liked, Doctor Desai's another point was, which I feel um, we all should do. But I think the younger people is how to remember uh, with uh, Ishita. We were discussing once how to make like a package and how to charge them. Yeah. So that's where the issue comes. Like you will charge for the device, and then you don't factor in. uh the visit how many visits to the new factor yeah yeah i charge for every visit yeah so they they have to pay i mean there's nothing uh, they have to pay unfortunately you know we're not god no and i think it's to be greedy our, we're not god our inability to make them understand that you have to pay yeah after many years of practice that's what i have come to so what i'll tell you what i was doing uh, which i have changed now few months ago is that once i was giving a cpap so i i do give cpaps i just said it's for life i look after them for you you can walk in any time and we'll do problem solving yeah so this just a few months ago i thought that why have i taken on this responsibility i have manpower every time the person walks in uh, somebody has to attend to the patient download the data do the troubleshooting check their mask i mean there's one uh, person's couple of hours are going with that individual yeah so if you have a car they give you this much free services then you pay yeah so now just one month ago 15 days ago we put our head to it and i said okay i decide to give it two years of free service i'll give two years hmm But after that it should be payment so i think mm -hmm. we are not able to put those numbers see how many hours of our time is going but i think all of you people when you start the devices you must factor in that and say that this is how much and people will pay but you be confident it will work and you convey to them that this will work and it's customized and then they are willing to pay yeah one brother we have so many people i mean we're looking at billions yeah, right so job. in india you create a market force get trained Three more patients and market forces will determine that the companies will want to be there and they will react to the market and they will drop the price. And you just told me, and so I pay two and a half, two hundred and fifty pounds for a flipping silencer here, and you are paying what fifty pounds? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask about titration. Uh, you said uh, that people can self titrate and things like that. Uh, So what does that depends mean? On, it depends on the patient. So if you try and get a, a patient that you suss out is sensible enough, then and responsible enough, then you teach them how to titrate themselves. If they're you know if you, if they're dexterous enough, if they're not, then do not let them because you know what they'll do is they'll take it home and they'll go from here to all the way forward, and then they'll say I've got jaw ache, my tooth is hurting, my tooth has moved. It's all your fault. That's what happens. So it's all about judging the patient, and we don't need to do like a level three uh, testing for them when they are doing post device. What is your protocol? So that? there's two things. One is that once I get the uh, 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 subjective data back, and they say, you know, I'm feeling great, you know, I I'm not snoring anymore, then I feel that okay, let's do a sleep test to see whether we've got where we need to be, and don't be shocked if sometimes your AHI goes up because. you're not always measuring just the apneas some of these apneas might convert into hypopneas and therefore now this might increase but you know as long as the the quality of life indices you know how they feel and what their concentration is like 
that is also very important. I think we're now moving away from the HI, aren't we, gradually? Yes, yes. But HI, HI is not as important HI now. So HI true. is not too yeah, so What absolutely. you're saying, what I get is that, yes, I agree that once the person has stabilized uh, with adaptation, adjustment, then it should be suggested that we get another level three. Yes. The other, the other thing I also wanted to say is, you know, we're also looking at compliance chips. Okay. Now, at the moment, compliance chips can be added on request. But like CPAP or unlike CPAP, it's not through the cloud. So the patient has to bring it back. You take the chip out, put it in the machine and see how compliant they are. Oh. Now we're looking at another system. Oh. By the end of the year, one of the companies is coming out with something which is going to be part of the device itself and we'll get the data through the cloud. But you know that's still a few months away yet. So, so that will give us compliance and it'll also tell us how effective the device is. Oh, very good. So this, which company is doing that? Somnomed? Somnomed, ProSomnus, all the higher end, yeah. What about that appliance that you were talking about, ma'am? Um, the WatchPad from ITMA. Yeah, so WatchPad is a home sleep testing level three. Right. Uh, it's a disposable one. I have used uh, the WatchPad 300 before, but I found it quite onerous. I found it, oh, you know, set it up, give it to the patient. The patient takes it away, leaves it on the bus or the tube, and they lose it. And, you know, then they don't return it for a few days. It's a pain. This, these are disposable. You give it to the patient, you set it up, give it to the patient, and then they throw it away in the morning, and I get the result through the cloud. So we have something like that in India now. Uh, the watch pad disposables are also here, but they're pretty expensive for us. So there is another one which was called in US something called as Night Owl. Yeah. Westmed yeah. here has got it. It's called I'm not very fond of the Night Owl, I'm afraid. Yeah, I don't think it gives us the raw data that we need. We don't give that the raw data. So it's like a very uh, crude kind of screening, but for people who don't want anything near their nose, don't want something like that, then it kind of. The Night Owl is good for. Um, titration purposes yeah. i wouldn't use it for diagnostics no i i'm using it more like for this like for, you know once people who are using their cpap we don't know what's happening so at least it tells you that okay and you know they don't want so much on their face then that thing is just it's and it's again disposable and true so if any one of you were to get completely proficient with scanning then dr bachia we could actually get the patient scanned and then i can have the dental devices made and sent back to you. So I think some of you should think about how, uh, see, I, I, if I were to look at the journey, uh, and Dr. Desai is here, for a, from a dentist to become a dental sleep medicine specialist. Uh, think about that, that what all should you add and uh, what all do you need? And, you know, and she's here to give uh, ideas and support. So it will be like a, you know, a process and a path will be cleared, created. You start off by using, um, by, by having a practice and then, you know, engaging with patients. The, your hygienists, by the way, are very pivotal in identifying those patients at risk. I mean, they see patients much more frequently than GPs or even dentists. So when you've got, you know, a few patients, you screen them, you assess them. You don't always have to treat them but get proficient with yeah. identifying those at risk. Then saying. start making the devices, then get a, make a few mistakes. You will make a few mistakes, I did too. And as you get more and more confident, you'll find that if it takes your interest, then that might become your major. That's how it happened to me. I don't do any regular dentistry anymore. My practice is just dental sleep medicine, TMD and sleep bruxism. That's all I do. I think that's a point. Um, that Start with screening. Uh, screening, matlab, this history-wise screening. Yeah. Identify the patients. If you are seeing in your own practice, think how many you are seeing in a day, 20, 30, 15, whatever. Out of them, at least 30 to 50, 40% will have OSA. Yeah. So you pick them up, get them tested. So now I keep the one I was also reading uh, that the dentists don't really have to start becoming proficient in sleep studies. So like you have whoever you want to tie up with, you tie up for the sleep study. Sleep study report goes back to you. The sleep yeah. physician will not interfere with that kind of an issue. You, you will have to create um, connections with your ENT, 
and the respiratory people. You have to do that. If you don't, if you start treating patients without engaging with them, you'll never get referrals from them. Ma'am, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a question regarding class three patients. What kind of a bite registration are we to take in patients who are class three? Exactly the same. I mean, okay, protrude it and exactly. Okay. Not that we increase the vertical component more, nothing like that. Well, there is another element to taking a bite registration. You, you can do vertical, but that's a completely different lecture. It's quite, in, it's quite in, you know, uh, I just yeah. started because the jaw will move in the direction that it does. If the right. jaw is vertically down, that's the vertical you'll apply. Right. You have to look at how the jaw is moving. Yeah. If you overclose them, then you won't get the results. Hmm. Would, would you say that once these people have identified, diagnosed OSC, should they stick, become more confident in the silencer as I understand it right for now? If that's all that's available, fine. But like get I said... More, get more confident. Use, use that more often. Use it for titration. Give it yeah. to much more people and uh, factor in there the... Will, there will be instructions available on the internet for using a silencer, by the way. It breaks silence. It said breaks. The compliance is really bad, at least for the patients that we've given it. It cracks. And yeah. then the patient, the it cracks in just a matter of few months. And then we send it back to the lab. And then the lab says that we're going to make another one, completely different one. So that, again, they charge for the same thing. So, yeah. Dr. Runit, so, have you used anything? Anything different? No, I have not used anything. Uh, uh, per se because uh, like I, I had a question and I, I wanted to ask about your experiences. The thing is that in India, uh, people are not aware that, you know, uh, uh, like uh, if they have a sleep problem of if, if they have a OSA problem that they, they should go to a dentist. Even uh, the medical professionals, they uh, either don't know, number one, or they don't know the right dentist to refer to. So uh, what about the other dentists, Indian dentists in this forum right now? Like what has been your experience? Like what is the complaint with which the patient comes to you? And uh, like, how do you get sleep patients? Louis? <laughs> By a lot of hard work over many years. So now I'm flooded with them. I have like no uh, it's, it's, with three. Just by talking to the patients, talking to your colleagues. I mean, when I started in dental sleep medicine, I was calling every ENT on the street, every respiratory guy, either they would call you back or they wouldn't call you back or they'd be responding with you. Now, they all come looking for me. So you have to convince That's, them that you are serious about this. Exactly. I mean, and you have to provide the results. Yeah. If you don't provide the results and you're in this thing to just make money, then you're not going to make it. So I can guarantee that. Steady, but over the years, it will move. But provided, like she's saying, we show persistence, we show that we are concerned and we want to do the best for the patient. So uh, in the sleep medicine fraternity here, a lot of people know about dental devices, I'll tell you. But yeah. we don't know where to send them. So that's the reason I keep on every few months, a few years, I keep on moving towards dentists that please do help. Yeah, I know. It's just about raising awareness within the community within the dentist community and within the medical community that this is what we can do. And you know what? The world is waking up. I mean, I remember the first time I gave a lecture 15 years ago, I walked up on the podium. I was nervous as hell. And I stood up there and there were, the room had about 70 doctors. And the moment I went on the podium, they literally all went on their phones, started talking to each other. And do you know what I did? I just stood there quiet. Nobody took any notice. So I literally turned my um, presentation off and I walked off stage. And I said, you obviously don't believe that I have anything of value to say to you guys. So goodbye. And the organizers came and said, no, Dr. Sai. I said, no, no, no. I said, I will not be disrespected. But you know, it comes with confidence. And if you're not confident of yourself, then forget it because you know, you're not gonna make it. And confidence can only come with education. Keep reading, reading, oh, reading. Yeah. You have to read. The more you read, the more it sticks in your brain. And then, you know, attend courses, you know, do online courses, do 
uh, whatever is available. I mean, there's somebody else in Mumbai who connected with me recently, and he has been working with, uh, he's some brigadier or something. He's been working with uh, prosomnus. He must have done one study with them. And honestly, I find the humility that you, Dr. Bhatia, have. I like the way you work. I like the way you, you know, engage with you. I mean, this guy, he knew it all. He knew everything. So I had nothing to add. Honestly, I had nothing to add. And I, I, don't want, I don't want to come across as someone who knows it all because I don't. I still make mistakes and I still misjudge a patient. And I still have a, you know, occasionally get a slap on my face because I let, not a little one. I'm but constantly writing down things and I'm connecting with people. Who, I, I don't know the answer to many of these things. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same with me. I, 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 I do misjudge patients. You know, somebody comes in, talks a big talk. Oh, yes, doctor, anything, anything you say. And the next day they'll call up and say, you know, I've changed my mind. And yeah. you've done all that work and they won't pay you. And these are billionaires, you know, these are billionaires. So I, I think the, so we'll start winding up and I want to yeah. thank uh, Dr. Aditi again for In this wonderful opportunity and for the youngsters who joined us. I think, you know, it's also um, sometimes, see, you may have also seen it, I've also seen it. Sometimes we think it's a very needed uh, topic, but there are only a few people who show interest. So I want to say that the ones who've shown interest, that means you're serious about it. Yeah. So and keep going. Don't give up. So keep going. going. But make it like a part of your routine. And I can only say that this is what she was talking about confidence. You know, like when I teach a lot of sleep, um, physicians for about CPAP, they say, how do you recommend people don't listen, people don't want it. So I say you first you convince yourself that it works. And then you can the patient will get convinced. So I'm convinced CPAP works. So I can convince people. I know sleep study needs to be done. So we can convince them. So you should know the dental device will work. And you will make it work and you will make the patient uh, comfortable. So you know, this whole issue every day with PAP, they're telling me, Will I be comfortable? Will I not be comfortable? So we do pap naps. We get them to the clinic. We make them lie down. Today, one lady came. She said, I had a spit night. I never slept. Today, I made her sleep for one hour. She's By the end of it, she ordered the machine and gone. <laughs> but you have to learn how to do this. Exactly. So, this and the thing is, you know, if you now that you're aware of this, yeah. you'll see more of it. Yeah. You'll be, you know, it's, it's raising the awareness. And then providing and, and providing the education, which is what we're doing. And then for you guys to take it further and provide the treatments that are required, you know, provide access to these patients who need it. So tomorrow, when you go into your clinic and you see a patient, and you say, who knows the airway better than us? Tell me. Who knows the oral environment better than us? We do. So when a oh, patient opens the mouth and the tongue falls back and you can't see the back of the throat, and then you know he's you you're trying to do a crown on the low left seven, and you know the tongue is in the way and it's scalloped, these are red flags. You should be thinking about all of this. Is he bruxing? Is he is he fat? Is he not breathing? Is he snoring? Suddenly you he starts snoring in your chair. These things happen, these are real life events. So these are the patients that you when they when they come out of your chair, by the way, you're making a slightly you know strange sound. How do you sleep? You know, do you snore? You know, do you wake up with a headache? You know all of that. All of these questions you ask, and this gives you a little bit of a cue whether these patients need further investigation. And then don't try and investigate them yourself. Send them to the medical people and build up the trust. But the doctors don't like the fact that we might be encroaching on their territory any more than I want the blooming anesthetists here or the, you know, uh, doctors, whoever take two impressions or, and then say, right, okay, we've now made a dental device. They have no clue about the mechanics, the science that goes behind these devices. So I don't want them treading on my territory. Why would I tread on theirs? So okay? what you can do is about, let's say in about 12 weeks, let's give some uh, ending talks to these people. Think about it, or at least let's say four weeks, unless 12 is very far away. By the end of your four weeks, think how many you've identified OSAs and what did you do with them? I think just start doing some self kind of, uh, so we're not, I mean, in practice, it gets difficult to do research. I spent too many years in AIMS, so I still start thinking about uh, data and stuff like that. But what, it's like a self analysis that if I saw in my total clinic, in these four weeks, how many did I, uh, sorry, am I audible to everybody? Yes, yeah. ma'am, you are. Okay, okay. 
So how many did you see? I think do your analysis. How many patients you see in four weeks? And how many were did you pick up as OSA? And what did you do for them? Yeah. So that's exactly. It's like you know assessment system. Like if I see how many sleep patients I see, I need to see how many studies I've done and how many got PAP and what's happened to the rest. Yeah. And you know the thing is, you know the the more you do, the more you'll become aware, and the more you'll realize. It's actually going to become a very, very important part of dentistry. This is the topic that's going to bring the medics and the dentists together. Up to now, it's always been them and or us. There's no such thing as them and us. We're all part. I mean, remember the oral environment is a gateway to the rest of the body. This oral health and overall health is a big topic at the moment. Everybody's talking about breathing, about, you know, and who needs to be taught breathing? I mean, we all know about pranayam. I mean, God, you know, if the Indians don't know about breathing, who else does? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'll say thank you. Goodbye. And thank you, Dr. But and, and, and thank you. I don't know your name who organizes everything. Snigda. Right. Thank you very much. You're, you're not on. She's on mute. Okay, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so yeah. much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope yeah. it's useful to you all. Thank you again. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.